The Stamina Necromancer continues to be one of the most important and versatile classes that you can play in the Elder Scrolls Online. Since its release nearly half a decade ago, crows have been absolutely essential to every raid composition. Update 40 is no exception. Whether it be for the sake of buff sets, major vulnerability, or simply the incredibly strong AoE damage that the crow provides, this class is a must-have in your toolkit as a damage dealer. Be sure to take a look at the description to not only get a plethora of resources from myself and other creators alike, but also to see the timestamps in case there's any one individual topic that you're interested in regarding the crow, or even if you want to go back and rewatch one section over another. We have a lot to discuss, so let's get into it. Getting into the basic build information for the patch, not much has changed here. Of our options this patch, the strongest race for the stam spec of the crow is still Dark Elf. Not only is this the strongest damage dealing option, it also allows you to very easily be able to switch between a mag spec if necessary, as Dark Elf is one of the strongest options for mag specs as well. As a couple of alternative races that will still perform well worth being aware of in my opinion, Orc is a pretty close second, offering the same amount of weapon and spell damage but giving a thousand less max stamina, resulting in a 1-2k DPS loss. Orc does have the benefit though of reduced sprint cost, increased movement speed, and being a bit beefier in content, adding a thousand max health and healing for 2k health whenever you do damage, occurring once every 12 seconds. Despite being a bit lower in overall DPS output, the perks of being an orc are a bit more enjoyable than Dark Elf if you're not concerned with pumping out as much damage as possible. Likewise, in solo, 4-man, or even unorganized 12-man content, Khajiit performs well in situations that leave you below the crit damage cap, offering 12% increase increased critical damage and a thousand max stam. Crit damage is a stat far more important than weapon and spell damage, but only to a certain point. You cannot benefit from having any more than 125% crit damage, and this is a value that tanks and healers in 12-man content can get you to pretty easily. But this is a really strong race to choose for the sake of solo, duo, or 4-man content, especially for a class like the Crow, who lacks any source of passive crit damage. As one final option for beginners to the game, a Red Guard can be a really useful choice for the sake of sustain. Sustaining resources is is really tough to do at a low level even for an experienced player, but this goes tenfold if you're not yet practiced in the concepts of rotations and resource management. There is no worse damage loss that you can suffer than running out of resources, making this a fantastic choice for beginners. For our Mundus this patch, the Thief will provide the most overall damage compared to any other alternative, especially in optimized 12-man content. Even in unoptimized groups though, you will very rarely use a different Mundus, especially since the Crow does get passive penetration from the Dismember pass which increases physical and spell penetration by 1500 whenever a Gravelord ability is active. Very rarely doesn't mean always though, so if you need to make up for discrepancies in penetration or crit damage, the Lover can help with pen and the Shadow can help with crit damage. As a final option, again for newer players, the Serpent can be good to help with sustain issues that you may experience early on. For our attributes, we are dumping all 64 points into stamina. It shouldn't be necessary for the sake of sustain or survivability in content to allocate these anywhere else, so we'll take the highest damage gain that we can by making our stam pool as high as possible. Regarding gear, our traits and enchants will be the same across all setups. For our gear weight, we typically opt for a 7 medium setup. This can vary though depending on group comp, related to topics like penetration, crit damage, and even sustain. For our body pieces, we will run them all as the divine trait with max stamina enchants. For our jewelry, we will run them all as the bloodthirsty trait with weapon damage enchants. Finally, for our weapons on the front bar, if you opt for a dual wield setup, you'll run the main hand Nernhound with a poison enchant and the off hand charged with a flame enchant. Two handed weapons such as a great sword or bow should be run precise with a flame damage enchant. On the back bar, if you are running a dual wield setup, you'll run both weapons infused. If you're running dual wield on the front bar as well, your back bar enchants will be one shock and one weapon damage enchant. If you are running a two-handed weapon on the front bar, your back bar enchants will be one poison and one weapon damage enchant. Otherwise, any two-handed weapon that you run on the back bar should be infused with a weapon damage enchant. For our consumables, we have plenty of situational options to consider. The option with the absolute most damage potential, also being the food we run on the dummy, is simple max stam food. The most common option in content, however, is blue buy stat food, which offers max stam and max health. 
This will be a little bit of less max stam than the green food option, and therefore a little less damage. But it will offer a ton of health, bringing the crow to around 30k HP. This food makes you pretty much indestructible in a raid setting outside of one-shot mechs. As a couple of alternative food options, Lava Foot can be really helpful if you find that you are having a very difficult time sustaining stamina for whatever reason. Maybe if you choose to run a stamina base spammable and stack stam skills on your bar completely, you might find yourself having issues sustaining, in which case Lava Foot will solve those problems for you. In raid, if you don't have the ability to use mag pots, but have a lot of mag skills on your bar, you might consider running Candy Jester's Coins, which offers max stam and mag recovery. This will also allow you to run a spammable and weapon power pots without having to remove mag abilities from your bar, without losing very much max stam from any of the previously mentioned options. Both Lava Foot and Jester's Coins do not give health bonuses, however, which is uniquely not much of a problem for the Crow, as we get a passive 1250 extra health naturally thanks to the last gas passive. And with that, for our post we will opt to run either the Alliance Spell Power, Essence of Spell Power Pots, or the Alliance Battle Draft, Essence of Weapon Power Potions. Both these potions give us the Major Spell or Weapon Damage buffs, Sorcery or Brutality, and the Major Crypt buffs, Prophecy or Savagery. Since our stats will all scale based on whichever is higher, it doesn't matter which potion we run for the sake of damage, but rather sustain. We will run the potions that restore mag in a dot setup, mimicking the build we use for dummy parsing because of all of the mag skills on our bar, despite specking into mag stam. Both spell damage potions also grant major intellect, increasing mag recovery by 30%. However, if we opt to use a spammable, we will take off one of our mag abilities, usually that being Scalding Rune, so that our mag sustain is no longer an issue. And when using a stamina based spammable, it becomes really tough to sustain without using the weapon power potion options, which both restore stam and give major endurance increasing stam recovery by 30%. Spammables on the Crow are very common to use in content, so it's important to spec accordingly. You can craft Essence of Spell Power by combining Cornflower, Lady Smock, and Water Hyacinth, or by purchasing the Alliance Spell Draft and Cyrodiil. You can craft Essence of Weapon Power Pots by combining Bless Thistle, Dragonthorn, and Wormwood, or by purchasing the Alliance Battle Draft and Cyrodiil. There are two alternatives to keep in mind for your potions, the first of which is Heroism Pots. Unless you are running the set Martial Knowledge, I'd recommend running the version that gives Mag and Stam by combining Dragon Room, Dragon's Blood, and Columbine. The Crow typically avoids these potions since we would lose some bar space having to double bar Camel Hunter to make up for the crit buffs we would be losing, as well as ensure that we have a DK support providing igneous weapons to make up for the spell and weapon damage buffs we would be losing. The trade, though, is Minor Heroism, which gives about an additional 30 ultimate over the course of the potion's duration. This gives us nearly a fifth of the cost of our Colossus, the ult most used by this class in content. It can help make sure that we have it ready whenever necessary to to ensure Major Vuln is kept up at as high of an uptime as possible. These potions also restore both Mag and Stam, as well as give Major Endurance and Intellect, the Stam and Mag recovery buffs. There are a few situations in the game where these are definitely worth running, but it will cost some individual damage. Finally, simple tripods are not a terrible option to use if you find that you're severely struggling with both Stam and Mag Sustain. You should try to avoid running these potions as like with Heroism Pots, you'd have to double bar Camo Hunter, resulting in a bit of a DPS loss. If you cannot figure out how to solve your sustain issues though and can't afford to run heroism pots, tripods will normally solve sustain problems for you. You can craft these by combining Columbine, Bug Loss, and Mountain Flower. Finally, for our champion points, we will opt to run Thaumaturge, Fighting Aura, Wrathful Strikes, and Exploiter. Exploiter acts as a double-edged sword, being the strongest CP in terms of boosting your overall DPS output, but requiring an additional buff up time for your support to be aware of, as well as requiring you to track off balance and play this six second burst phase as if it were in cap on a Nightblade, meaning that you need to prepare for and burst during these windows in order to maximize damage. This is extremely difficult on console as tracking the cooldown requires all buffs to be turned on, making it difficult to spot the single icon you are looking for among the masses. Making this CP worth not much more more than other alternatives to most players, especially in content. The CP shines though in trash pulls, when skills like Scythe are being used to provide AoE off balance. In short pulls where you shouldn't be using much more than your spammables anyway, you end up getting all of the benefits of Exploiter without the hindrances of uptimes or brain power to worry about. Our next most important CP, Thaumaturge, on a dot setup, it's no surprise that we are running Thaum, as this CP buffs almost every single ability on this spec. The Crow is very unique in that we get 10 
20% increased damage with our damage over time effects, thanks to the passive Rapid Rot. This makes Dotson AoEs far stronger and more important to the Crow than any other class, and is where 80% of our damage comes from on this class. Biting Aura is the next best CP for the Dot build to have on the Crow due to the importance of Blast Bones. We need at least one CP that buffs Blast Bones, and this skill is unfortunately one of the only sources of damage in this toolkit that Thom does not buff. Biting also buffs our AoEs, which include Boneyard, Cloak, Siphon, and Caltrops, making the CP the clear winner for the Dot Crow. Between these skills alone, Biting Aura buffs nearly 40% of our overall damage, which doesn't even include a few miscellaneous sources of damage as well. Finally, Wrathful Strikes is the next strongest CP we can run, as the other CP options primarily boost single target oriented damage, such as spammables, which don't really exist on a dot setup. Wrathful Strikes buffs individual skills at a value less than that of the primary damage CP, but the buff applies to all of our damage, resulting in a larger net DPS increase when compared to Deadlier Master, which would buff a much smaller percentage of our total DPS output. Regarding the other primary damage CP, the most important to be aware of is Master at Arms. When running a spammable, with the exception of Whirling Blades, Master at Arms will be worth more than running Biting Aura. Both Biting Aura and Master at Arms buff our Blast Bones damage at an equal damage output. However, Biting buffs more of our dots and AoEs, and Master at Arm buffs our spammable damage. So for spammable scenarios, especially in content, run Master at Arms over Biting Aura, and if you stick with the Dot Roto, run Biting over Master. Finally, Deadly Aim is the least valuable CP option on the Crow, as it will only buff a very small percentage of our overall damage when running a spammable. But even then, not enough to warrant swapping anything else off. The only exception to this idea might be in burst scenarios, when in a short fight where your dots become less relevant and your spammable becomes extremely important, deadly aim could be worth running depending on the setup. And finally, as some optimization champion points to be aware of, in optimization situations that leave you below the 18,200 pen cap, you can opt to run Force of Nature in place of either Exploiter or Wrathful. This CP gives about 660 pen per status effect, which, in an organized group, should reliably give you an average of about 1980 extra penetration over the course of an entire fight. In situations where you may have to spec into light armor, or are just under the crit cap for whatever reason, you can make up for the lost crit damage by running either Backstabber or Fighting Finesse to to ensure that you are still at crit cap. Backstabber should be used in fights where you can consistently flank the boss, that is, stand behind it, for the entire duration of a fight, and fighting finesse should be used when you cannot accomplish this. Getting into the gear information for the patch, I'm going to discuss the most relevant beginner setups that you can start with and then dive into a comprehensive list of all of the relevant meta and situationally meta gear sets, alternate sets, buff sets, mythics, monster sets, and arena weapons. Starting off with the beginner setups, Order's Wrath is a really strong and easy to obtain set from the overlands of High Isle, requiring the High Isle chapter, assuming that you don't have a guild house within a tunable for the set, or even a friend that can craft it for you. This set offers a lot of crit chance and crit damage to essential and particularly difficult stats to come by early on. This set can also be purchased from guild traders. Back Alley Gourmand is a solid alternative to Order's Wrath, providing a ton of crit damage, but no extra crit chance with its fifth piece. This set requires requires the Firesong DLC and can be found in the overlands of Galen or be purchased in Guild Traders. Mother Sorrow is a really strong and easy to obtain set, providing an insane amount of critical chance. No DLC required for this one as it can be farmed in the overlands of Deshaun or be purchased in Guild Traders. This set is not incredibly optimized for stamina characters though, as it does give a single line of mag, so with that you could consider using Leviathan instead, as it is the stamina version of Mother Sorrow. I typically recommend Mother Sorrow because it's much easier to acquire, but Leviathan is technically a bit better. It does require you to farm the dungeon Crypt of Hearts, but this dungeon isn't incredibly challenging. You can go with either set and have near identical success. Another set worth considering, especially for solo situations, Spriggan's Thorns. This set provides an absurd amount of the most important stat in the game, Penetration. Though I would consider the previously mentioned options a bit more useful, this set also requires no DLCs and can be farmed in the overlands of Bankerai or be purchased in Guild Traders. Finally, if you are looking for an incredibly easy base game craftable set to run, Hunting's Rage is likely the best set that you can use in this category. This set gives a ton of crit and weapon and spell damage and can be crafted in Bankerai, Reaper's March, or the Rift. Getting into the most valuable meta sets, that is, the gear sets that you will see run in the vast majority of content, depending on the situation, of course. Starting with the strongest pure single target set in the game, Perfected Arms of Reliquin is a medium armor set coming from the trial Cloud Rest that outputs about 8 to 10k DPS over the course of a fight. Reliquin is best run in long single target fights where the boss is the priority target. And 
and any associated ad or mini boss will never need much attention. This set should not be run, however, if you cannot maintain its 10 stacks consistently, which requires you to light attack the target at least once every 4 seconds. This makes the set incredibly worthwhile on fights like Teleria in DSR, for example. However, the shorter the fight, the less overall value the set has. If there is anything preventing you from maintaining near-perfect uptimes, especially in shorter instances, this set will not hold its value, and is best replaced by something more consistently maintained. An example of this concept might be the first boss in VKA. The boss jumps into the air under 50% health, and he is untouchable for a few seconds. An extremely experienced player can light attack right before and right after he lands, and still maintain Reliquin. But even an experienced player could see stacks drop here, implying better options may exist. Next up, Aegis Caller. This set comes from the dungeon Unhallowed Grave, and is the next strongest proc set in the game, doing its damage in a pretty large AoE radius, making Aegis Caller very reliable for solid AoE damage. Offering two lines of weapon and spell damage, plus a line of crit, this 8 to 10k DPS set procs off of martial melee critical damage. That means that there is a bit of RNG to this setup, which can get a little bit annoying on the dummy. Of the proc sets we can run, Aegis Caller is likely the most difficult to track and maintain, due to the aforementioned proc condition, martial melee crit damage. We will back bar this set when we run it most often, which means that only Stampede, Carve, and our light attacks can proc the set if they crit. Stampede is guaranteed to crit on its initial hit, making this skill best to reproc Aegis Caller when necessary, but this will require you to reapply Stampede about 3 seconds early on average to keep good uptimes with the set. Keeping strong uptimes is going to be more of a damage gain than overcasting Stampede will be a damage loss, despite it obviously being unideal. Next up, coming from the dungeon Falkreath Hold, Pillar of Nern is a versatile medium armor set that does 6-8k DPS in a really small AoE radius. Pillar is primarily considered a single target set, but can have AoE utility if stacks are tight and consistent enough. It is much easier to maintain than a set like Aegis Caller simply proccing off of damage done. Despite the set's weaker 5th piece, Pillar of Nern's 2-4 through four bonuses make it worth only 1-2k less overall DPS than a set like Aegis Caller. If you are looking for a strong and easy to use proc set, this is one that is still good enough to be considered meta. Next up, coming from the trial Dreadsail Reef, Perfected World of Depths is a versatile light armor set that does 7-9k DPS in a large AoE radius. This set does incredible AoE damage and procs on damage done, making it extremely versatile and easy to maintain in raid situations when slightly stronger alternatives cannot be 100% managed. We typically will run World of Depths in mobile AoE fights where Reliquin would be useless to ensure that we have a trial set active for the Minor Slayer bonus. When we can consistently get good value out of World's AoE procs, that is, when all targets are easily and consistently hit by it, World will be our strongest trial set AoE alternative that we can run on the Crow. One of the strongest medium armor trial sets in the game, Perfected Coral Riptide comes from the trial Dreadsail Reef and is a go-to in fights where you need a medium armor trial set for the sake of AoE damage, in situations where the previously mentioned trial sets can't be maintained well. This set gives an insane amount of weapon and spell damage whenever your stamina is at or below 33%. Riptide has the highest mastery curve out of any of the alternatives in my opinion as it requires your stam to be below 33% for max utilization, but running out of stamina is the biggest form of damage loss that you can suffer, and doing so would make the set not worth running. This is also a set very commonly run on the MKDD, as it is a solid medium armor set, and the martial knowledge buff DD will likely be around that stamina threshold anyway. Finally, coming from the trial Sanity's Edge, Perfected Onsol's Torment is a medium armor trial set best used in the same scenarios as described with Riptide, but offering a comparable amount of damage without having to micromanage stam. Though not quite as strong as Riptide, Onsol offers a flat 7% damage done bonus, which doubles if you get an interrupt for 10 seconds. The bonus damage is not something that can be reliably maintained, I feel, as there are very few fights in the game that allow you to consistently interrupt targets to maintain the possible 14% damage done bonus. However, if you find yourself in one of these rare situations, this will be one of the outright strongest damage options for the Crow. That said, the 7% damage done bonus in combination with a buff set like EC, most typically run on the Crow, will be a very strong and brain dead setup to maintain. Getting into the alternative set options, these can be paired with any of the meta set options depending on the fight and in certain scenarios will even help to build combinations stronger than any of the previously mentioned sets. Starting off with Azure Blight Reaper, this is a medium armor set found in the dungeon layer of Marcelok and is an incredibly powerful set on this class in particular in AoE type fights. 
Azure Blight's damage is done after 20 stacks are built on a target, and these stacks are built with damage over time effects. The Crow's damage is primarily based on damage over time effects, which means that nearly every skill in this toolkit will help to build Azure stacks. The incredibly strong damage from this set is proccing extremely often. To break down the set's functionality, Azure is best used in fights with two or more priority targets. The value of the set increases the more targets that there are, but this is dependent on those targets' health. It will only be worth using Azure in situations where targets have enough health to get this set to proc at least once and can be held close enough together to ensure that the bomb hits all intended targets. Take for example a fight like Oak's Hard Mode. There are constantly at least two priority targets, but the short range of Azure makes it a little difficult to consistently ensure that the bomb will hit all priority targets. There are a ton of low health frogs that spawn in throughout the fight, but their low health will never really allow Azure to build and proc off of these adds since they are almost always killed instantly. These conditions make Azure not really worth running on this boss. On boss A, however, there is always at least a Flesh Atro or a Fire Behemoth stacked near the main boss throughout this entire fight. Each of these targets has enough health to get multiple procs of Azure before it's killed. Running this set on Basse is a no-brainer. A final note about the set's functionality, since there can only be one Azure proc active at a time, and there is a limit to how quickly stacks can be applied, your group's benefit from people running the set will cap out at around 4 players, maybe 5, as this is about the point in which Azure is procking about as quickly as it can be. Adding a 6th DD in Azure won't make it proc any faster, and will begin to result in some losses. Overall, this set is an absolute must-have for the Crow, as its damage when it is worth using is completely untouchable, and by far the strongest AoE set in the game. On the Crow, you'd likely run Azure in combination with either Solzon or Whirl, opting to front bar one of those two sets in Body Azure. And with that, Perfected Solzon's Torment is a medium armor set coming from the Trial Rock Grove. This is simply one of the best sets in the game in terms of damage output, but it has relatively difficult proc conditions, as well as requires some of the highest level of brain power to achieve peak effectiveness out of all of the set options. Solzon's proc conditions require a target to die roughly once every 30 seconds, and when such an event occurs, a feigned target is put on the corpse. It can be a bit tough to see, but if there are enough small adds dying constantly and you're aware enough to get this buff, without losing time on target or faltering in your rotation, Solzon will provide the strongest damage boost out of really any other set. Not only is the set itself strong, but if maintained properly, you can even drop the kilt in favor of another mythic such as Velothi or a Maelstrom weapon as well, as you won't need the kilt to help hit crit cap. Examples of good places to use this set might be the first boss in VDSR, as the dog adds spawn consistently throughout the fight, or the first boss in VRG, as the frog adds spawn throughout the fight in a similar fashion. Next up from the dungeon Frost Vault, Zogvin's Warband is a really good set if you need extra bar space, which is a situation that you'll most often find yourself in when performing out of group mechanics, such as VSS or VCR portals. Zogvin's proc conditions are incredibly simple, only requiring crit damage to be dealt, and once you reach max stacks, gives you a consistent source of minor force, allowing you to drop traps in favor of a different skill. It also offers an extra line of pen, which is always really helpful in solo type 12 man situations. From the trial Hell Ross Citadel, advancing Yokita is no longer particularly meta, but is worth mentioning because it only provides 1 to 2k less DPS in a perfect world when compared to the meta proc sets. This is an extremely strong alternative, especially in short or phased fights. Its proc conditions are simple, requiring martial melee damage to simply be dealt, meaning that at worst we will always build stacks with our light attacks. Each stack offers two. 141 critical chance, making this set very bursty for boss fights that aren't quite short enough to acuity bomb, but also not long enough that it would be worth running a set like Reliquin. That said, it is a heavy armor set, so it must be run on the weapons and jewelry. Finally, known mostly as a duo, the Elfbane and Mechanical Acuity sets go hand in hand, with Elfbane usually run on the back bar, along with all of your flame-based skills on the back bar, and Acuity always run on the front bar to control when your burst of near-perfect crit occurs. The idea of this setup is to extend all all of your dot damage so that it lasts throughout the entire or nearly the entire duration of a short fight, while also allowing for more spammables during this time, as spammables make up the highest percentage of your overall DPS output in shorter instances. This should be used in bursty situations, that is, boss fights that last 20 seconds or less, such as the spider in VHOP or the snake in VRG. If the fight is too short, you shouldn't have time to drop all of your dots, making the setup weak on most trash pulls. But if the fight is too long, then this setup's burst value loses its worth, making it very niche. That said, 
however, Mechanical Acuity on its own is a really strong burst set that is good to have access to for certain trash pull situations. On tough ad pulls that require massive burst, you can pair Mechanical Acuity with a set like Solzon and Acuity Bomb Trash, dumping your ultimate and using your spammables with perfect crit, outputting anywhere from 4 to 500k AoE DPS in an extremely short period of time. This set has a pretty long cooldown though, so you have to be selective when choosing which pulls to use this setup in. Think detrimental trash pulls such as the pull before Fallgraven in VKA, the pull before Bosse in VRG, or the pull before Teleria in VDSR. As a note, for maximum optimization, you'll want to run double swords, as well as infused body pieces. Since Divine's body pieces with the Thief Mundus stones and daggers just increase our crit chance, a stat that's brought up to 100% with mech acuity. Divine's is redundant with this set, so increasing your resource pool is the next best DPS increase that you can min-max with your gear pieces. Getting into the most relevant buff sets for the Crow this patch, sadly in update 40, the Crow's damage and content simply does not compete with any of the meta class options. The only real reason to have a Crow in your comp is for its buff capabilities with the Colossus and with Elemental Catalyst. Coming from the Dungeon Stone Garden, EC is a must-have buff set in your raid comp as it plays a major factor in ensuring that your DDs hit the 100 125% crit damage cap. This is best run on a crow as the proc conditions require a source of flame, frost, and shock damage, elemental damage types found naturally in the crow's toolkit. There was a time where enchantments could proc these effects, opening up any class to have the ability to run this set, but since this is no longer the case, not a single class in the game can run this set without losing a ton of damage, whereas the crow can spec into a meta skill setup and run this set effectively. The most traditional way to run EC was to use an inferno staff with wall of elements on the back bar, as well as to run mystic siphon and Boneyard to achieve all three effects. However, with the changes to weapons in Update 39, the Lightning Staff has become an equally competitive option, making Lightning Wall, Boneyard, and Scalding Rune an effective way to keep these sets' debuffs active in fights where Siphon is tough to maintain due to poor boss hitboxes, such as Ysela in VSC, or fights that demand excessive movement, such as Teleria Hard Mode in VDSR. Finally, if you want to maintain EC with a 2 h setup, you could use Scalding Rune, Boneyard, and Mystic Siphon to do so as well. Another common buff DD set, War of Alkosh is a medium armor set that comes from the Trial Maw of Lorkaj, and is a must-have in your raid comp as you will need this set to ensure that the DDs are hitting pen cap. This set has historically been most used most often on a DK, as the Crows in group typically run other buff sets. However, this set is very well maintained on a Crow as well. Alkosh procs a 6k pen debuff as well as a decent damage over time effect whenever you use a synergy, lasting for 10 seconds. In general, all but the Orb and Purify synergies will only become available to 6 allies, potentially meaning your Alkosh DK could have some downtime on the set if things don't line up well, or if they or other players make a mistake in their rotation. Having a Plarin group with the Purify Synergy should solve this problem, as every synergy in the game has a universal cooldown of 20 seconds, meaning that you could use Orb, get Alkosh for 10 seconds, then use Purify on Alkosh's cooldown, getting Alkosh for another 10 seconds, and then have the Orb Synergy off its cooldown, ready to be used again once that proc expires. Again, assuming that these skills are always active and available. Any downtime on these abilities or slight mismanagement of Alkosh, though, will result in a big damage loss, however. Therefore, having a Crow run Avid Boneyard provides a consistent third synergy that you can self-utilize to leave a little wiggle room for personal or group error, which will likely result in more consistent uptimes. Next up from the trial Halls of Fabrication, both Master Architect and War Machine provide Major Slayer when you use your ultimate, based on how much ult you consume, which can be used very effectively in situations where running Roaring Opportunist on a healer might not be practical, such as Vast, for example. Likewise, there are some fights and strat combinations in the game that allow Slayer sets to just naturally be good. In general, Slayer sets will provide more overall damage for your group as well in situations where you might consistently have only 5-6 to six DDs active at a time. Examples of this might be specific strats on the first boss of VDSR, depending on how you split your group up and execute, Navi Hard Mode, as 3 portal DDs are downstairs for the majority of the fight, giving your upstairs DDs longer and more consistent Slayer, or on Reef Guardian Hard Mode, where you'll always have at least 2 portal DDs downstairs. Outside of these fight types, if you want all 8 damage dealers in group to get Major Slayer, you need 2 people in your group to run the set and utilize Slayer stacks, to ensure that the correct people get Slayer as these sets target the 5 closest players. If you do not split the group into 2 Slayer stacks, either a support might accidentally get the buff, or a damage dealer who already has it could get it again, resulting in a large group damage loss. The final element to note is that these sets are usually run on a buff crow, as Slayer can be timed well 
well into an ult rotation with a Colossus. If this is the only buff set you are running, you can pair Master Architect with a medium armor dungeon set like Aegis Collar if you so choose, but if you are running a light armor buff set like EC for example, you should run War Machine instead, which will do the exact same thing, but give you a medium armor trial set that offers Minor Slayer to pair with your buff set. The final set worth mentioning coming from the overlands of Craglorn is Martial Knowledge. This light armor set is likely the weakest buff set in the game in terms of group damage, and the first one to go if necessary. But if there is room for this setup in your comp, it should be included. MK offers an 8% damage increase to targets afflicted with the set's debuff, which is applied when you light attack a target with less than 50% of your max stand pool full. You can only get up to roughly 63% of the 8% damage increase as the debuff lasts for 5 seconds with an 8 second cooldown, making it actually worth a little less than a set like Zen, assuming perfect uptimes, which normally is not possible. This set is best run on classes that don't overtly rely on stamina or have unnaturally high stamina recovery, as dumping that resource to 50% and maintaining that level is more possible the higher your stam sustain and the less you utilize it. This makes the Crow a strong candidate to run MK, however, it's usually run on the Sork in groups, as the EC MK setup not only often results in poor MK uptimes, but is also a huge individual DPS loss to the player that ends up just not being worth the amount of damage that the group gains. Splitting up the buff sets is usually just the best for individual and overall group damage. For our trash setup this patch, not much is changing. This information primarily pertains to PC, but I believe is important for console players to be aware of as well in order to better be able to optimize for console rating. The most common trash setup includes running Solzon paired with Briarheart, a set found in the overlands of Rothgar, as well as the Velothier Mage's Amulet in the Maelstrom Inferno. Solzon is the uncontested meta in trash situations. Crit is king in these types of pulls since they are so short, and this set provides nearly 10% extra crit chance and 12% extra crit damage. Increasing our crit chance makes our damage a bit burstier, and this set allows us to still hit crit cap despite sources of crit damage not being able to all be consistently applied in that short window either. In the past, for our other set, we've opted to run Burning Spellweave in Trash, as it offers the highest damage increase out of any other alternative in a much shorter window of time. However, for stamina specs, Briarheart ends up being a slightly stronger option, offering a line of stam rather than mag, as well as a line of crit chance rather than weapon and spell damage. Both stat lines will be more preferable for a stam spec for Trash than the lines that Burning Spellweave offers. For our Mythics this patch, the strongest option for the Crow in single target situations is the Harpooner's Waiting Kill. This Mythic provides a ton of crit chance and 10% crit damage, helping us to reach the crit damage cap when all other buffs and debuffs are provided by the support. In any fight where you aren't taking overt direct damage, this mythic will be the strongest damage output option, especially on a class that doesn't get passive crit damage like the Crow. However, on fights where you take constant direct damage such as low card mode, or even newer progression scenarios on the first boss in VRG or VDSR, this set loses its value. When you cannot run the kilt effectively or in AoE fights in general, the best mythic option will be the Velothier Mage's Amulet. This mythic is a solid option for the Crow that is much easier to use, providing very similar DPS output to the kilt, even in single target scenarios. This mythic increases our damage done at the cost of your light attack damage, which on a crow accounts for about 7-9% of our total DPS output. In order to hit crit cap with this mythic, you'd have to slot fighting finesse over wrathful strikes as well. Doing so will result in about 1k less overall damage for the dummy setups. However, as mentioned in AoE situations, this will be the strongest overall option for damage period. Since we can only light attack one target at a time in an AoE fight, Light attacks will account for a percentage that is significantly less of our overall DPS output. And for this reason, buffing our abilities that will do damage to all targets at a value of 15% will be worth far more overall DPS than the kilt, since the trade-off is a minimal hit. This is the reason we choose to run this mythic in trash pulls in addition to AoE type fights such as Reef Guardian or Boss A Hard Mode for example. Finally, Spalder of Rune is a must-have mythic on one player somewhere in your raid composition, providing 260 weapon and spell damage to 6 players, but reducing your health health, mag, and stam recovery by 70 for each player hit, so up to a total of 420. This is best run on classes that have insane sustain like the Crow, or by classes that are running the set Martial Knowledge, which requires your stam pool to sit under 50% in order to receive its group buffing benefits. Running this mythic will make it easier to keep your stam pool lower without really having to focus on keeping it low by casting extra stam abilities or even bash weaving in some scenarios. For our monster sets this patch, the strongest option for single target being the set that we run on the dummy is Zahn. 
This set comes from the dungeon scale color peak, and it provides the overall strongest single target damage between any of the monster options in the game. Zon's proc conditions are simple, requiring a light attack to crit, which will create a fiery beam that attaches to your target that ramps up in damage over 10 seconds, also afflicting your target with burning. This results in a max tick of 22k. Its one piece is also a line of crit, which is the best stat line in the game. The damage itself from the proc is only beaten individually by Kialnar, but because of the extra uptimes that we get with burning, as well as its one piece, Zahn ends up being the strongest overall monster that we can use for single target. While the set can provide some AoE damage, it's not reliable, and the set does require you to be somewhat in melee range. If you need AoE damage or cannot stay within melee range of the boss, I'd suggest using something different. And with that from the dungeon Crypt of Hearts, Narayanith is the best option if you are running a monster set in an AoE boss type fight. The single target from the set is not the absolute strongest, but it is pretty competitive with a set like Zahn. Its proc conditions are incredibly simple, requiring direct damage to be dealt and does not have any niche element in order to maintain its proc. Simply do damage and boom. For AoE burst situations, however, such as trash pulls, Grothdar will be the best option. This set comes from the dungeon Vaults of Madness, and though its single target will not hold up to any of the previously mentioned options, Grothdar works really well for trash type fights if you have room for a monster set or don't have access to the previously mentioned trash setup. It procs simply off of damage done, and it does its damage in a huge AoE radius over a very short duration of 5 seconds, only having a 10 second cooldown, lining up very well with most trash pulls. From the dungeon March of Sacrifices, Baylorg is a set used to maximize single target burst damage. This set offers weapon and spell damage equal to the amount of ult you consume, and physical and spell penetration 23 times the amount of ult you consume. Ideally for a burst fight such as the Spider and V-Hop or the Snake and VRG, you would save 500 ultimate for the start of the fight, and then get the massive weapon and spell damage and penetration increase that the set would provide for an ulti that large, for about the entire duration of the fight. There are very few situations where this is possible, as those buffs only last 12 seconds. But in the fights mentioned, that's about how long you either have to do damage to the target before it becomes invulnerable, or about how long the fight should last anyway. Finally, if you choose not to run a front bar, back bar proc setup for the sake of simplicity, it often involves dropping the monster set altogether and using an arena weapon instead. There are plenty of real content scenarios where you might want to do this to maximize your damage on a specific fight as well. In these situations, you will have room for a one piece monster bonus. Slimecraw gives the strongest bonus out of any other set, oddly being the only helm whose one piece provides 771 crit chance, compared to every other monster's one piece crit chance being 657. You'll opt for this one piece crit, assuming all penetration buffs are adequate. If for whatever reason you are under pen, which realistically should never happen on a crow in an organized raid group, Again, thanks to our passive Dismember, you would opt to run a set that offers a line of penetration, such as Valken Scoria, Archdruid, Krag, or Lady Maligda. Again, very rare, but a situation to be aware of nonetheless. Finally, for our arena weapons this patch, you will usually opt to run an arena weapon, as discussed, if you are trying to simplify your setup and rotation, as we do with the static roto, or if you are running EC and need to run a destruction staff to help apply one of these debuffs. Keep in mind, whenever running an arena weapon, you will always drop the monster before you drop the mythic. So with that, the Maelstrom Inferno with Wall of Elements is one of the strongest AoE sets in the game. The damage increase that this set provides to Wall makes its damage greater than or equal to skills like Talons on the DK. Its single target is not the absolute strongest, but it is within a few K DPS of options like the Maelstrom Greatsword, making this a go-to option for trash situations on the stam spec of the Crow. Outside of raw damage, as mentioned, running a staff could be necessary to keep strong EC up times in a fight, but in AoE situations, it is essential. For this reason, we will run the Maelstrom Inferno or Lightning Staff a ton in content. If you don't have to worry about EC though, the Maelstrom Greatsword is the strongest overall single target option to run on the back bar. This set adds 560 damage to our direct damage attacks, heavily buffing skills that tick for direct damage multiple times in a short window, like Rapid Strikes, the spammable we run in the static rotation. Though monster sets typically provide a bit more damage than the Maelstrom Greatsword, if you don't want to micromanage back barring a proc set like Aegis Collar, or if you're on a class with enough passive crit damage to drop the kill, this will be the best single target option. Buffing our highest damage dealing abilities such as Blast Bone, Siphon, and even a spammable if we choose to run one. Finally, when opting for a spammable in content, the Master's Bow becomes a really strong option giving 330 weapon and spell damage to targets infected by Poison Arrow. Since the changes to weapons in Update 39, bows have become extremely competitive with the typically meta weapon options. In fact, in burst situations, the Master's Bow can even provide a little more overall single target damage. In these situations, fewer skills end up resulting in a larger overall percentage of your DPS output, so running sets and skills that will buff those sources of damage ends up being a higher DPS increase than the traditional dummy setup. 
in a burst scenario, Blast Bones and whichever spammable we choose will be the main sources of damage that we want to buff, and the Master's Bow will do that nicely. Getting into the different primary skills, that is, the skills that we run on the dummy. This will act as a general guideline that we'll use when discussing the different flex options that we can utilize instead of some of the given primary skills. Starting on the front bar with Avid Boneyard, this skill provides us with a solid amount of damage, outputting about 5.5k DPS over the course of a fight, as well as the Grave Robber Synergy, which ticks for upwards of 45k on impact, outputting roughly another 2k total DPS. Altogether, the skill is responsible for about 6% of our damage output, dealing nearly 8k damage per second, making it one of the most important dots on our bar. However, you should use the other morph Unnerving Boneyard in Raid as it helps maintain consistent Fracture and Breach, especially in AoE situations, and the synergy becomes offered to your group members instead, which they will get a bit more damage out of anyway. It is important to note that Boneyard only does this type of damage though if it consumes a corpse, making it important to not cast Siphon right before the skill. This is a concept that we will touch on thoroughly in the rotation section of the video. Deadly Cloak is a very strong damage over time effect, especially near the end of a fight, as the dual wield passive slaughter increases the damage of this ability by 20% against enemies under 25% health. In addition to this, Cloak helps keep strong uptimes on our burning and poison status effects by proccing our enchants on the front bar. These are normally maintained with our light attacks, but since we are only light attacking on the front bar 70% of the time, keeping Cloak active can help fill some major gaps in uptimes. Finally, outside of its raw damage, Cloak also gives you major evasion, reducing damage taken from area of effect attacks by 20%. Stalking Blast Bones is the bread and butter of this class and by far the most important skill in this toolkit, our entire rotation is built around casting the skill as much as possible. If we consistently cast Blast Bones 1 in 3 skills as it allows, we will end up getting over 22k DPS out of the skill, accounting for nearly 18% of our overall damage output, with a max tick of up to 88k. Not only does Blast Bones do the most damage of any ability, it also creates a corpse to help skills like Boneyard and Siphon do good damage as well. And with that, Detonating Siphon is another extremely important skill in this toolkit, most known for its pseudo spammable utilization. The skill is completely free to cast and does a large amount of burst damage every time it's reapplied, ticking for up to 41k. For this reason, on a dot setup, when we have nothing else on the class that needs reapplication, we can cast Detonating Siphon as a source of free damage. You can also begin weaving the skill in between casts in a raid situation if you find that you're running out of resources. An example of this concept may look something like Blast Bone, Skill, Siphon, Blast Bone, Skill, Siphon on repeat until resources recover. Outside Outside of the pseudo spammable element, the dot itself from the skill results in roughly 4k DPS, making the damage over time component of the skill, in terms of raw single target, a little weak, but in combination with the spammable element, one of the most important abilities on our bar. Barb Trap is our primary source of minor force, as we spend the majority of our time on the front bar, with that bar being home to the majority of our high damage dealing abilities as well, we will choose to run Trap on our front bar to give our strongest abilities a bit of a damage buff through the Slayer passive in the Fighter's Guild tree. This passive increases our weapon and spell damage by 3% per Fighter's Guild ability slotted. Outside of its buff importance, Trap itself does a considerable amount of damage on its own, providing only a little less damage than skills like Degen or Scalding Rune, at a DPS value of roughly 4k damage per second, while also giving really strong hemorrhaging uptimes, producing an extra 3 to 4k DPS increase as well. For our ultimate on the front bar, we are opting to run Flawless Dawnbreaker. Much like Trap, this skill is on our front bar primarily as a buff skill, utilizing the Slayer passive mentioned earlier. That said, near the end of a fight, if you can't get the full duration of your shooting star, you can cast Dawnbreaker instead, which, especially with the Crow passive Death Knell, that increases your crit chance by nearly 25% when your target's health is below 25% in this setup, will give you a huge burst of damage at the end of a fight. Moving on to the back bar, starting with Scalding Rune, this is our go-to flex spot on this spec. This dot does mediocre damage, outputting about 4k DPS, but is the strongest alternative choice that we have between really any other flex skills. This skill also works as an extremely small AoE, providing a dot to any target it hits within its radius, as well as a very strong tick of burst damage on initial application. In fact, this component's max tick will be over 5k stronger than Detonating Siphon, making Scalding Rune a very strong secondary pseudo spammable to use if you cannot use Siphon due to corpse issues, whether it be a situation 
situation where you can cast two pseudo spammables back to back, or even in the rare instance that Boneyard takes the only available corpse. Next up, when running a great sword, Stampede is one of two skills that becomes a must have. Stampede is a very strong damage over time effect with an initial strike whose critical chance is guaranteed. This initial tick plus the damage over time results in about 6 to 8k total DPS with the skill. Stampede is our strongest raw dot and our second strongest damage over time ability, just behind Boneyard. A must have. Carve, while the skill itself is not a particularly strong dot, only outputting a combined total of about 5k DPS, that is, 4k for the dot and about 1k for the damage on application, it is slightly stronger than other flex alternatives that we could run. The main value that we get out of this skill though is its duration. Carve has one of the longest timers in the game, lasting for up to 32 seconds when stacked three times. Long damage over time effects like this allow for more casts of other abilities like Blast Bones and our pseudo spammable detonating siphon, making it an extremely strong option. Skeletal Archer is another flex skill in this setup, outputting roughly 4.5 to 5k DPS. The only utility outside of the decent damage that this skill provides is an additional corpse, which can help allow for more pseudo spammable casts of detonating siphon, as well as help to ensure that Boneyard is always consuming a corpse on its reapplication as well. Though helpful, all the corpses we need we should be able to get solely from Blast Bones, and running this skill just helps to build the strong dot roto that we utilize from dummy parsing on this class. This is one of the first skills to drop in content. Anti-Cavalry Caltrops is just another relatively decent 4-5k DPS dot in this setup, Unlike the other skills that do comparable damage, such as Rune, Archer, or Degen, Caltrops does its damage in a massive AoE radius, making it one of the most valuable flex dots in this setup. No real utility outside of its decent AoE damage though. Finally, our primary ultimate, Shooting Star. This is the strongest damage ultimate that the Crow has access to when not using a Destruction Staff. Simply put, Shooting Star is one of the strongest ults in the game, outputting roughly 5 to 7k DPS over the course of a 3 minute fight, with only 3 total casts. Since we only cast it 3 times, that 5 to 7k total value can be a little misleading. Shooting Star's damage over time effect can tick for upwards of 28k every second, with nearly an 80k tick on its initial application. It's very strong and very bursty for this reason. The AoE is a little small though, so if your goal is to get good AoE damage out of the skill, make sure it's very well placed. Otherwise, you might be better off running Elemental Rage, a skill we will discuss in the Flex Skills portion of the video. Getting into the flex skills for the Necromancer, that is the most commonly used exceptions to the primary skills that I myself and many others use in content, depending on a given fight. Starting in the Gravelord tree with Glacial Colossus, in content the Crow is mainly run as a DD spec for its buff utility with Elemental Catalyst and for its source of major vulnerability with this ultimate. You will replace Shooting Star with Glacial Colossus 95% of the time that you run this class in 12 man. Major Vuln increases damage taken to the debuffed target by 10 10%, and Glacial Colossus will apply it for 17 seconds, refreshing that timer each time the Colo does damage to a target. The Colossus smashes three times over three seconds, which means that if all three strikes hit, you will get Major Vuln on the target for 19 seconds. With a bit of organization, the Crow can keep this debuff up by themselves for nearly the entire duration of any fight, mainly due to how cheap this ultimate is as well. For example, a Crow can use this ult and then have the debuff get extended by the set Nazare, run on a support, which will add another 24 seconds to the 19 second timer, resulting in up to 45 seconds of Major Vuln. By the time Vuln runs out, you'll have another 19 second Colossus ready, and then can receive Pillager from the healer to get another one by the time that 19 second duration is out as well. This results in nearly a minute and a half of Major Vuln from one ultimate with a standard raid comp. For longer fights, you can even run Archdruid to make up for any short windows of downtime that might exist. In this example, I keep up Vuln with a standard Crow rotation for over 5 minutes with nothing very special. Just the Colossus and Archdruid on myself, and Pillager and Naz on my partner. With these common raid sets, you can keep Vuln up indefinitely. When running a spammable, Venom School is the strongest option that we can run on a Crow, but by a razor thin margin in terms of damage output. Maximizing your damage with this skill requires a bit of practice and can be a little tricky. Every third cast of the skill does 50% increased damage, resulting in a max tick of 69.8k. However, casting any Necromancer ability contributes to building that third cast. It's easier to think of this cast mechanic as a stack, essentially, you want to cast this spammable only whenever you have three total casts of necro abilities, which will build the three stacks necessary to get the massive increase to the damage that this skill can do. The niche element to the skill though is that you can actually cast Skull with only two stacks active. In the cast of Skull will build the third stack a microsecond before the ability is sent out, resulting in that third increased damage tick 
actually taking place. This requires a bit of a weird mini game, trying to ensure that you are casting the skill whenever it gets to that second stack so that you don't have to waste casts that would otherwise build its stacks without letting your dots and AoEs drop though. It only will be your front bar abilities that can build these stacks, which means that you will build one every time you cast Blast Bones. If not for Siphon, this would be easy to maintain. Simply cast Skull every other Blast Bones in combination with one dot or AoE that needs to be reapplied. As a priority, do not let your dots and AoEs fall off for long in an attempt to do this. It will never be worthwhile. Whenever Siphon needs to be reapplied, you will always pair it with the Skull Cast. Since Blast Bones builds one stack, Siphon builds the second, and Skull can be used immediately to get to stack three just before releasing the 50% increased damage cast, all in one click. As I said, it's a bit complicated, but if you're up for the challenge, and only if you can min-max this skill in this type of way, it will be the strongest spam option for the Crow. The final note to this ability is the way it buffs our damage as well. Not only can we get 10 to 12k DPS out of this skill, it also helps to buff our damage through the Death Knell passive, which increases crit chance by 8% per Gravelord ability slotted against enemies under 25% health. Because the DPS of this skill individually is less than 1k of a damage difference when used correctly compared to other alternatives, Venom Skull becomes a slightly stronger option due to this buff as well. Next up, the other morph of Avid Boneyard, Unnerving Boneyard offers a source of AoE Major Breach, making it a bit more versatile in a real raid situation. In 12-man content, you are usually there as a crow to buff your group's damage, and this morph still gives the incredibly strong Grave Robber synergy, but to your allies instead of yourself. Providing this synergy to your allies and offering them a source of AoE Major Breach makes this morph a little more optimal in content. The other morph of Skeletal Archer, Skeletal Arcanist will be a decent source of damage in an AoE type fight, as this morph does less damage per second than Skeletal Archer, but does its damage in a pretty large AoE radius. That said, in content, we will typically opt for a spammable, which means that we begin slotting more skills to buff that spammable as well, and we don't have room for the mage on our bar. This makes Skeletal Arcanist a skill to be aware of for flex situations if you end up having room for it but one that's still pretty low on the priority list. Mystic Siphon, this is the other morph of Detonating Siphon, most typically used when running the set Elemental Catalyst as a source of shock damage. If you are not going to run a Lightning Staff, you will have to use this morph of the skill to ensure that this debuff is kept up consistently. The damage per tick of the AoE is about the same as Detonating, but we do not get the burst damage with this morph, and instead receive 150 Health, Stam, and Mag Recovery. Taking away our pseudo-spammable means that you have to run a spammable in content if you use this morph. The extra sustain help also allows in maintaining sets like Spalder or expensive skills like Mystic Orb, as the Crow's sustain without this skill is already phenomenal, but adding this skill into the mix makes it nearly impossible to run out of resources. Moving into the Bone Tyrant tree, starting with Ruinous Scythe, Scythe is a decent AoE spammable for the Crow, most often used in trash pools when your group is specced into Exploiter. The raw damage output from this skill is not nearly as strong as an ability like Whirling Blades, only outputting 6k DPS in a single target dummy fight with a max tick of just 37.5k. However, providing an instant source of AoE off balance makes this skill a huge DPS gain for your group in trash situations. Remember, Exploiter is particularly good in trash because you don't have to worry about its cooldown. You get all of the benefits of the massive damage increase Exploiter provides without the downside of the cooldown since the trash pull should be dead within 7 to 10 seconds, nearly matching the duration of off balance. This skill also applies hemorrhaging to targets hit, which isn't really relevant in the 21 mil comparison of our spammables only adding about 1k DPS, but is really nice for trash as it ends up being an extra free damage over time effect that can tick for up to 7.7k per second, adding an extra 30k damage to every single target hit. It sounds small, but it adds up and is the main reason that Scythe can even be competitive against a skill like Whirling Blades and Trash. Necrotic Potency is a must-have skill in Trash for a Crow as well. This skill allows you to siphon corpses for ultimate, and in Trash pulls, this typically results in an extra 100 ultimate per pull. This will allow you to drop your Colossus for Major Vuln on nearly every trash pull in any trial. Necrotic Potency has some niche value on different boss fights as well, such as the Spider and Vihoff, for example. Since you kill a bunch of adds before starting this fight, you can ult on the first lever, use Potency once the boss becomes in Vuln on all the dead adds, and have an ult back for the second lever as well. There are a few other niche fights in the game where Potency has value in this kind of way, and I encourage you to experiment with this skill in raids. For AoE situations, Agony Totem can be a really strong source of AoE minor vulnerability, a deep 
debuff that increases damage taken to the debuffed target by 5%. Though in update 40, Minor Voln can usually be pretty easily handled with an arc support running colorless pool. I suppose there are a few situations in the game that require an AoE source of Minor Voln, and the Crow DD can provide it with the skill if absolutely necessary. Moving into the Living Death skill tree, Reanimate Blast Bones is pretty good for progression scenarios with a short-term goal in mind. It can save an entire run, as using this ult instantly revives three players. However, I think it ends up being a net negative in the long run for player progression, as I believe it's simply better to learn the fight correctly rather than rely on this crutch. Otherwise, your ability to progress further and replicate that content becomes hindered. If you don't have any intention on mastering content, there is no harm in using this ult. But if you are watching this part of the video, I imagine that that is not the case for you. Just my opinion, make the decision that is best for you and your playstyle. Resistant Flesh is a really strong burst heal for this class. Its initial heal is incredibly strong and it offers bonus resistances based on how much healing was done. This can tick for upwards of 20k, so not only will it be very strong to use for restoring health, but it will also make you super beefy after completing the cast. The only downside is that it gives you minor defile, but for only 4 seconds once used, a debuff that decreases healing received and health recovery by 8%. This debuff sounds far scarier than it actually is though, and isn't really a detriment at all. Resistant Resistant Flesh is a go-to for solo type 12-man scenarios where you will take large and short bursts of damage, such as VCR portals for example. Getting one massive burst of healing every so often and enjoying the benefits of increased resistances as well as the necessity for mobility when running the orb makes this skill a no-brainer if you find yourself handling this mechanic. Spirit Guardian is a really strong skill for healing but not in the way that you might think. I don't find this to be incredibly reliable for self-healing, but more so preferable in situations where you and a teammate or two might need to perform solo type mechs away from healers. The main example that comes to mind is VSS hard mode portals. This fight really only punishes you for making mistakes mechanically, requiring very little healing for expert players. In this type of a situation, running the spirit guardian can end up being all your group needs to comfortably clear, which would prevent the other DDs from having to lose damage by slotting their own source of healing. Again, not the overtly strongest healing option that we have access to, but relevant for situations where you are taking sustained damage and or might have other players that you can help out as well. Worth being aware of in my opinion. More coil, I've only seen this skill used on Reef Guardian hard mode for Portal Crows. Attacking the Reef Hearts can be a bit of a long fight, as you will usually have to kill two of them back to back, keeping you away from the group for around two minutes, making it the longest portal type mechanic in the game. Here, you will need healing, but you will also need some resource help, and this is where Mortal Coil comes into play. This is a fantastic skill for situations where you need a little bit of healing and a little bit of sustain help, whether it be Reef hard mode or even solo and four man type content. Getting into the dual wield skill tree when running a dual wield setup on the front bar, Rapid Strikes is one of the strongest spammables that the Crow has access to. The skill ticks four times, with each tick increasing by 5% of the subsequent hit, resulting in up to a 71.2k max tick if all four strikes crit. If you get good enough crit RNG, Rapid Strikes ends up being just as strong, if not a slightly stronger raw spammable option than Venom School. However, due to Venom Skull's buff utility, if you min-max Venom Skull, it will be slightly stronger than Rapid Strikes, but by a razor-thin margin. If you want an easy spammable that you don't have to micromanage, this will be the best option for this class. Whirling Blades is the raw, strongest AoE spammable in the game. This morph increases the damage of this ability by up to 100% to enemies with less than 50% health, doing more damage the less health a target has. This in combination with the dual-wield passive Slaughter, which increases damage with dual-wield abilities by 20 20% to targets under 25% health makes this skill incredibly strong and bursty for short fights, like trash pulls for example. Above 50%, Whirling Blades can tick upwards of about 45k, and below 25%, the skill has a max tick of 88.5k, resulting in about 7.5k DPS over the course of a long single target fight. Obviously, the value increases dramatically in AoE boss type fights or trash pulls. The only problem is that we typically run this skill in a full damage spec, but the Crow's role in 12 ban is usually centered around buffs. In trash pulls, Crows most often run Scythe to help proc off balance to all targets, despite the skill being significantly weaker. And even in AoE boss fights, the cost of this skill can make it tough to sustain, which typically means that we'd have to result to the weaker Silver Shards as an AoE spammable instead. If you are not providing AoE off balance and trash, this will be a must-have for those situations. And if you can sustain this skill in AoE boss fights, Whirling Blades will simply be a stronger option. 
Getting into the bow skill tree, bow bow setups are rarely meta in content scenarios. However, if you do find yourself in that situation, Lethal Arrow is one of the strongest spammables that we can use on this class. Lethal Arrow has a max tick of about 61.6k and will output around 10k DPS over the course of a fight. Lethal Arrow also gives us a consistent source of the poison status effect, which will add another 2k overall DPS compared to a skill like Venom Skull as well. Venom Skull though has a slightly higher ceiling overall, being a bit stronger in terms of raw DPS output and buff utility, but Venom Skull is much more difficult to use. If you want a spammable option that you don't have to micromanage in a Bobo setup, this is a skill that is far easier to use and does only slightly less damage. Endless Hail is a go-to skill when running a bow. This AoE will provide more overall DPS than other dot alternatives such as Degen or Scalding Rune on its own, which makes it more worth running. It also does its damage in a large AoE radius. However, it will be by no means the strongest skill in this toolkit, only slightly outperforming the flex skills. Poison Injection, when opting for a bow, you will usually do so for the sake of burst damage, which makes the Master's Bow an incredibly strong option to run. This means that you would have to slot Poison Injection. The skill itself is a pretty decent damage over time effect, really doing its damage towards the end of a fight, but is most relevant due to the set it's paired with, which offers 330 weapon and spell damage to targets afflicted with Poison Injection. Moving into the Destruction Staff tree, even on a Stam Crow, it's super common to run a Destruction Staff for the sake of Elemental Sources for EC, when doing so, running Wall of Elements when running a staff on the back bar is an absolute must, as Wall remains one of the strongest dots in the game, outputting roughly 5 to 7k DPS in a large AoE radius. Unstable Wall is a bit niche, as the timing of the fight's phases have to line up well enough to make Unstable worth using. For example, if a phase lasts about 30 seconds and the boss goes invuln, but Wall will explode three full times perfectly within the fight, Unstable will be stronger than Blockade. Blockade, however, is usually your go-to morph of Wall in content. Since Lost depths, spammables have increased in value, encompassing a larger overall percentage of the DPS output, making dots with longer durations a bit more preferable in order to get more overall spammable casts. In situations where wall does not line up perfectly, this will be the go-to morph. Elemental Rage is one of the strongest and burstiest ultimates in the entire game. This is a must-have for trash pulls whenever running an Inferno Staff, and a solid option for the Crow when running a Destruction Staff, since we lack a strong class ultimate for single target situations as well especially those requiring burst, assuming that you're not running the Colossus for whatever reason. Moving into the Fighter's Guild tree, Silver Shards is the spammable run on the Crow most typically in AoE boss situations, but is one of the weakest spammables listed here. Silver Shards will output roughly 7k DPS over the course of a single target dummy fight, a value that obviously increases in an AoE situation, and has a max tick of just 47k. Coming in with just a 5 meter radius that is 1 meter less than Whirling Blades, Silver Shards will fire bolts at other enemies near the original target, but deal 22% less damage. This is never a skill that you want to run in trash, as Whirling Blades and Scythe are just better, so you would only ever consider running this skill against Whirling Blades for AoE boss type fights. Whirling has a larger radius, does not have a damage penalty for hitting other targets, and simply does more damage. However, Whirling costs much more and requires you to be within melee range of your targets. This makes Silver Shards a spammable option that we run in content when we either cannot sustain or effectively utilize Whirling. If you can sustain Whirling though, you should run it. Camo Hunter is a strong buff option when attempting to maximize either burst damage or simply maximize damage with your spammables. This skill gives 3% weapon and spell damage thanks to the fighter skill passive Slayer, as well as provides Minor Berserk when slotted and flanking your target. Minor Berserk is usually sourced by Combat Prayer, given by the healers. However, certain fights in the game, such as Vass, make it impossible for healers to keep adequate Minor Berserk uptimes on the damage dealers, making this skill extremely valuable in that fight and others like it. Finally, whenever running Heroism Pots, this skill is one of the few options that can be used to ensure that you get Major Prophecy. The crit buff typically provided by Spell Power Pots, consistently on the slotted bars. When running ult pots, you'll usually double bar this skill on a class like the Crow that cannot source these buffs via class abilities. In the Mage's Guild tree, Degeneration is a solid single target Magicka Flex dot to be aware of, outputting roughly 4k DPS. The dot itself is only ever used if you have nothing better to run, with one exception. This morph provides major sorcery and brutality, a buff typically provided by our spell and weapon power potions, so if you do not have major sorcery and brutality sourced through your tank via igneous weapons, and you want to run ulti pots, 
spots, this is a must-have on your bar setup. The other morph, Structured Entropy, provides a nice balance between damage and survivability. This morph does just as much damage as Degen, but rather than providing the spell and weapon damage buffs, it gives a decent little heal over time. This is a go-to skill for longer fights, where you shouldn't really need a burst heal per se, especially if you're experienced, but rather where simply having some sort of healing would be necessary. The primary example that comes to mind is the VSS hard mode portal mechanic. Ideally, you don't want to sacrifice damage by slotting a heal if you can avoid it. And with enough practice and experience, structured can be enough to get you through a fight. In the Sigic Order Tree, Race Against Time is a solid skill that can be used as a pre-buff to boss fights or in trash pulls if you aren't running Velothi, acting as a source of minor force, giving it to the caster for 20 seconds when used. In situations where you might not be able to pre-buff with trap, you can quickly slot, use, and unslot Race Against Time to ensure that you have minor force, the buff provided by trap, as the fight begins until you're able to naturally cast trap in your rotation. Likewise, in trash pulls, it is rarely ever worth using trap, even for minor force, as your spammable just holds too much value in these incredibly short fights, making race against time an ideal skill to slot instead to pop between trash pulls. In the Undaunted skill tree, starting with Shadow Silk, though I've never seen this skill used in content by a DD, it is still a noteworthy skill in my opinion. Shadow Silk is likely the weakest skill listed here, but not by much. It acts as a pretty decent stam AoE, outputting a solid 5 to 6k DPS, but with a massive handicap of only being 10 seconds long. In a meta where spammables account for so much of your overall damage, even as a crow with the pseudo spammable detonating siphon, having to cast this skill once every 10 seconds, and especially a skill that isn't overtly powerful, usually results in a DPS loss. However, you may find yourself in a situation where you're having a hard time sustaining Magicka, and you might want to add an extra stam AoE to compensate for this. Assuming Caltrops isn't already slotted, using this skill won't always be a terrible idea in this scenario. Mystic Orb provides more damage than any of the aforementioned flex slots such as Degen, Rune, Shadow Silk, or Caltrops, and provides the group with the Combustion Synergy, which does a ton of damage and restores resources. The only problem is that, like Shadow Silk, it only lasts 10 seconds. An orb is not really strong enough on its own to be worth the amount of casts that you'd have to spend maintaining it. It's probably a good idea to have at least either one damage dealer or one of your support run this skill for the sake of overall group DPS, but it will be a slight personal DPS loss. The Crow is one of the only classes that really has both room for and the ability to sustain this skill, so it will likely be your responsibility to run it in content. Finally, getting into the Assault Tree, Resolving Vigor is one of the strongest heals that any class has access to, period. Now, not only does Resolving Vigor provide a massive heal over time, it also gives minor resolve, increasing physical and spell resistances by about 3,000. This doesn't sound like a huge deal, but this provides a noticeable increase in survivability. In any situation where you might have to perform mechanics away from healing, this should be your go-to. The other morph, Echoing Vigor, I have seen used quite often in sweaty 4 and 12-man situations, where you might opt to drop the healer altogether in 4-man or only run one healer in 12-man. For example, if you drop the healer in 4-man, it's usually wise to have all three DDs, slot Echoing Vigor, and if the group is experienced enough, this amount of healing will suffice for most content. Likewise, in 12-man content, a group pushing score in VSS might use only one healer, slot three DDs with Echoing Vigor, and position them carefully to give the heal to all DDs during beam phase on a fight like low card mode. This heal is very strong, and this alone is enough to survive a damage-intensive mechanic, as mentioned, in an extremely experienced group. And finally, Proximity Detonation, this is a really strong burst oriented skill that can be used in trash pulls. The goal is to cast the skill as a pre-buff, attempting to time it so that it goes off right at the beginning of the pull before anything dies. This skill does its damage based on targets hit, so you want to make sure that proxy hits your primary targets, in addition to all of the little adds usually associated with trash pulls to maximize its value. If you can use it as a pre-buff consistently in this way, it will be worth slotting. Before getting into the static and dynamic rotation for the Necromancer, I'd like to take a brief moment to go over all of the basic elements in doing damage on this class, concepts which will apply to both rotations. These concepts will help to teach how the static rotation is designed, as well as help you understand how to perform the slightly higher damage dealing dynamic rotation. After discussing both rotations, I'll take a brief section to discuss what adapting these rotations for real content scenarios might look like. Starting with the most important concept to master on the Crow, Blast Bones is the absolute foundation of the Necromancer. When used correctly, Blast Bones ends up being our highest damage dealing ability by a very high margin, being absolutely unmatched in DPS output by any other ability 
in this toolkit. Nothing is more important than Blast Bones. In order to maximize this skill's damage, you need to cast it as an absolute priority on cooldown, which ends up being once every three skills. That is, Blast Bones, skill, skill, Blast Bones, skill, skill, and so on. Assuming that you are close enough to the target. If you find yourself to be ranged, you'll have to use Blast Bones one in every four skills, which will be a huge damage loss. One of the next most important elements in doing good damage is based on maintaining your set procs. The sets in this setup aren't too terribly difficult to maintain. We have Reliquin active on the front bar, meaning that it can only be reapplied when we light attack on the front bar. Since Blast Bones is on the front bar though, we should never spend more than two skill casts on the back bar, making this set nearly impossible to lose, assuming you are not missing light attacks. Our other proc set, Aegis Collar, can be a little trickier to keep up. The only abilities that will proc this set on our back bar are Stampede, Carve, and our Greatsword light attacks. Since we are flipping back and forth between bars very often on this class, you shouldn't really have to micromanage this set too much. Anytime I have two skills that need to be reapplied on the back bar, especially if one of them is Carve, I usually just rely on that skill or my light attack to reproc the set. However, if you only have one or even no back bar skills needing to be reapplied, you run the risk of letting Aegis Collar fall off for an extended period of time. In these situations, you should just cast Stampede, whose initial tick is a guaranteed crit, which makes this skill guaranteed to reproc Aegis Collar. One of the elements to the crow that make the damage dealing spec unique is based on how we utilize corpses. Our pseudo spammable detonating siphon only is able to be used if we have a corpse available to consume. Blast Bones creates a corpse every time it lands, almost always giving us at least one corpse to use. The tricky part is that Boneyard also needs a corpse to maximize the skill's damage. Sometimes we will have two corpses available, especially thanks to our skeletal archer, which when reapplied, assuming it's gone through at least half its duration, will create an additional corpse as well. You can track whether or not you have a corpse available by looking at detonating siphon. If the skills icon is lit up, a corpse is available, but if it's dark, there are none available. The main concept that this matters for is when Boneyard needs to be reapplied and either siphon also needs to be reapplied or is ready to be used as a pseudo spammable. In this instance, it's important to ensure Boneyard gets the corpse, so cast that skill first and if siphon Siphon is still lit up, you can cast that skill next. If Siphon cannot be cast, reapply the dot or AoE next closest to its expiration. If nothing is close to expiring, cast Scalding Rune as a secondary pseudo spammable. The next concept to discuss is based around the topic of weaving. It's important to know which skills weave abnormally and or which skills you should attempt to bar swap cancel when necessary. On the Crow, the only skill that has any sort of niche element to casting is Stampede. Stampede will lock you in place, unable to bar swap or cast another skill for a brief period of time as a part of its natural functionality. Stampede will behave like any other skill if this locking animation is broken with movement. Any sort of movement used simultaneously while casting will allow the skill to function like any other. A tap of your W key on the keyboard or a slight wiggle of the thumbstick on a controller while casting the skill is enough. In terms of bar swap canceling, typically we want to bar swap skills that have long animations. For the crow, this really only applies to Stampede and Boneyard. If you want to speed up your weaving a little bit, bar swap canceling these skills will help the rotation to feel a little less clunky, and likely increase your speed a bit, producing a small damage increase. Like with any other class, we also want to make sure that we understand the core principles of timer management and how these principles directly affect the crow. The crow's rotation is likely one of the simplest dynamic rotations in the game. If you're new to the concept of a dynamic rotation, this is the perfect class to learn the concept on. In a perfect world, the goal is to allow a skill to fully expire and reapply it immediately on its expiration. This isn't always 100% percent possible, especially when prioritizing Blast Bone casts, but is achievable with a high degree of consistency on the Crow. Usually reapplying skills with less than one second left is fine, but we do want to allow Skeletal Archer to fully expire, even if it means letting the skill fall off for a couple of seconds, since it increases in damage with each tick. If you reapply the skill too early, you miss the timer, completely missing the final and highest damage dealing tick of the ability. Do not reapply the skill early under any circumstances. Finally, as a general rule for improvement, practice efficiently, it will never ever be worth doing full parse after full parse for hours at a time. For the sake of productive and efficient improvement, I wouldn't suggest doing full parses for more than an hour. Otherwise, you're just going to get drained and start regressing. There is only so much improvement that you can make in one setting. Take a break and come back refreshed. Furthermore, you'll maximize your efficiency by isolating areas of the rotation that need work. Whether it be specific skills that you aren't weaving well, certain skill combinations in the static rotation that you're not weaving well, or losing track of certain timers in the dynamic rotation. As opposed 
opposed to full parses. Isolating and practicing the things that need improvement will translate to better and faster progress in your full parses. Focus on and isolate the areas of your rotation that need work. Don't waste time doing full parse after full parse, which not only has you practicing the things that you don't need to practice, but also make it difficult to work on the specific and minor details that you need to improve on. Only go into that hour of full parse after full parse though, once you are competent in all of the damage dealing concepts that we've discussed and competent in whichever rotation you decide to use. I promise you will see much quicker improvement if you parse like this. Now that we understand the fundamentals of the class, we can put all of this information together to determine a solid static and dynamic rotation that will work well for single target boss type fights. We will go over both the static and the dynamic versions of this rotation. I would advise, especially if you're newer to the class or endgame rotations in general, to use the static rotation as a tool to familiarize yourself with the class and its weaving so as to eventually progress to the dynamic rotation. That said, you can expect the static rotation to do well, but definitely not as well as the dynamic rotation as the dynamic leaves room for more consistent dot reapplication, as well as allows for more overall pseudo spammable casts with detonating siphon due to the more consistent reapplication. So with that in mind, let's discuss the static rotation. I built this rotation to be very beginner friendly. Since the crow's meta dummy setup is based on a dot rotation, the primary skill setup involves different combinations of timers that makes it impossible to build a purely single target rotation. To fix this, we will take off a couple of 10 and 15 second timers and attempt to build roughly a 21 second rotation, keeping on skills that have 20 to 24 second timers. Likewise, maintaining Aegis Color on the back bar with no dynamic elements to the rotation will create extremely poor uptimes for this proc. Finally, since we can't spec into a dot rotation, we will run a spammable. For these reasons, the following changes will be made to the setup. We will drop our monster set and run one piece slime craw as well as the Maelstrom Greatsword on the back bar, opting to front bar Aegis Color for better uptimes. We will replace Boneyard with Rapid Strikes on the front bar, and Caltrops with DGen on the back bar, giving us another 20 plus second timer. Finally, since we are running a spammable, we will need to use the stamina version of the weapon power potions to have a way to restore that resource pool and source the important buffs that the potions typically provide. All of these changes result in only about a 5 to 7k DPS loss, as I myself managed to get about 126.5k with the dynamic rotation, in early parts that should have gotten an extra 1k with Aegis Collar if it was maintained better, while managing about 121k with the static rotation. To bring up a quick comparison though, in just the previous parse, I hit 120k but had much better crits on both Blast Bones and Rapid Strikes. The damage difference of these two abilities, had they crit well, would result in about a 2.5k DPS increase, bringing this parse up to about 123 to 124k. Remember that even though our effective crit chance is 62%, that goes up to nearly 90% in Execute, so the value with which we'd consider a crit to be good would be somewhere in the 70 to 80% range, which is why I think the static rotation has a lot more potential than the simple 121k. Getting into the demonstration, this rotation may appear pretty complicated at first, but is very straightforward once you get the hang of it. Remember, Blast Bones is cast every third ability, which makes the visuals appear to contain a ton of skills. It's easiest to memorize and just think about this rotation in sequences of two, casting Blast Bones between each sequence. So with that, if you want to absolutely maximize your damage, you'll start with a bit of a niche pre-buff. Ensure that your kilt stacks are fully built, reset the target, use Dawnbreaker, and then hit the well. Doing this will only add 1 to 2k at most to your parse. After you hit the well, start far enough away from the dummy to get a 3 skill blast bone window. Begin the pre-buff, which goes Archer, Blast Bones, Shooting Star, Trap, and at this point you'll throw your first light attack signaling the opening of the parse. That opening goes Stampede, Blast Bones, Siphon, Rune, Blast Bones, Carve, Degen, Blast Bones, Cloak, Spam once, Blast Bones, Spam, Spam, and then we will start the actual rotation which we will repeat until the dummy dies. That rotation goes Blast Bones, Stampede, Carve, Blast Bones, Siphon, Archer, Blast Bones, Trap, Rune, Blast Bones, Cloak, Degen, Blast Bones, Stampede, Spam, Blast Bones, Spam, Spam, Blast Bones, Spam, Spam, 
and repeat. A few quick notes about this rotation. First and foremost, this roto assumes that you are a full damage crow. If your job is as a buff crow in content and you are using this rotation, you'll want to slot Boneyard over Degen and simply replace Boneyard where Degen is in the rotation and reapply Boneyard a second time in the rotation where the last spammable cast is listed. Near the end of the opening, you will want to make your second cast of card before Stampede, otherwise it might fall off here. Likewise, try to use your ult the second it is ready, right at 200 so that it lines up with Exploiter on its third cast. If your average DPS with this rotation is in the 115 to 120k plus range, you'll only be able to drop three shooting stars and then cast a Dawnbreaker when it becomes available in Exe. If you are averaging less than 115k, you'll be able to drop four shooting stars, and then you can use Dawnbreaker if you happen to get it back above one mil boss HP. Finally, in Execute, I usually reach the spammable portion of the rotation with around two mil dummy HP left. After completing those spammable the dummy would usually be at around 1 mil HP or less. If this is the case, just blast bones and spam until the dummy dies. If you are above 1.2 mil though when you finish the spammable portion of the rotation, go ahead and do the whole roto one more time, and then blast bones plus spam only until the dummy dies. Getting into the dynamic rotation, the crow is very straightforward. The goal is simply to reapply skills whenever they are about to run out, that is if there is less than one second on the timer, and to cast detonating siphon as a pseudo spammable when nothing else needs to be reapplied. If you cast Siphon as a pseudo spammable and nothing still needs to be reapplied, cast Scalding Rune as a secondary pseudo spammable. If you have skills that are about to run out simultaneously, a situation you should pretty rarely run into, you should reapply skills based on a priority of reapplication. Determined by either the importance of a skill and how it buffs your overall damage, or simply by the damage the skill itself produces. That priority goes Carve, Blast Bones, Shooting Star, Trap, Boneyard, Stampede, Archer, Caltrops, Cloak, Rune, Siphon. Note that when the boss is under 25% health, Deadly Cloak shifts to be a higher priority than Archer due to the dual wield passive Slaughter, which increases the damage with dual wield abilities by 20% against enemies with under 25% health. Getting into the demonstration, here you can start with a niche prebuff that will increase your damage by no more than 1 to 2k if you so choose, build your kilt stacks, then reset the dummy, cast Dawnbreaker, hit the well, and then start the prebuff. Start far enough away from the dummy to get a 3 scale Blast Bones window, and so that cloak doesn't erroneously start the fight. That pre-buff goes Cloak, Archer, Blast Bones, Rune, Shooting Star. Then we will throw the first light attack signaling the opening of the parse. That opening goes Stampede, Blast Bones, Siphon, Boneyard, Blast Bones, Trap, Carve, Blast Bones, Degen, Siphon, Blast Bones. And from here on out, we will reapply skills as they expire, following all the rules discussed in the previous section. Remember, if you need to reapply Boneyard and Siphon at the same time, whether it be for the sake of Siphon as a dot or pseudo spammable, cast Boneyard first and then cast Siphon. Though not always a problem, you may run into a situation where you don't have two corpses to consume back to back, and following this rule will ensure that you always are getting the 30% damage increase for Boneyard. If you follow the opening to a T, this will never be a problem for the very start of the parse, only something to look for later on. Don't forget that you can also use Scalding Rune as a pseudo spammable if Siphon does not have a corpse available to consume. This can happen if you cast Boneyard and consume the only available corpse, or if you've just used Siphon and don't have any more corpses to cast it a second time. Scalding's burst damage is just as good, if not even slightly better than Siphon, so don't forget to use it. Make sure that you are keeping track of Aegis Collar. It's not uncommon on the Crow for the set to be reapplied relatively naturally, even on your back bar, especially if it runs out while two back bar abilities need to be reapplied. But if it runs out without any back bar abilities needing to be reapplied, cast Stampede to guarantee its application. Try to cast Shooting Star at exactly 200 ult so that it lines up with Exploiter as often as possible. If you are averaging above 115k DPS, you will only get the full duration of 3 Shooting Stars, and will get more value from using a Dawnbreaker when you get it back in Exe. If you are below 115k average DPS though, you'll be able to use 4 Shooting Stars. If you've used Meteor 4 times and can get a Dawnbreaker back, still with over a mil left of the target's health, go ahead and cast Dawnbreaker as well. At around 500k or less on the dummy, regardless of what needs to be reapplied, just cast Blast Bones in 2 times Siphon, or Blast Bones in Siphon plus Scalding Rune to burst down the dummy and shave a second or two off your parse with good crits.
While I maintain that the 21 mil is a great place to practice and learn about a class and its unique damage, content demands that you make some slight adaptations to the pure single target rotation in order to maximize the damage that you do in PvE encounters. For example, while this rotation is great for long single target fights like the bosses in VKA or in Sunspire for example, this rotation will not be the absolute most optimal way to go about burst oriented fights, especially AoE burst situations like trash pulls. In general, this rotation can be adapted to two main situations. Single target in AoE burst. Single target burst fights encompass entire boss fights or boss phases where it would not be worth reapplying any more dots or AoEs. In general, spammable damage accounts for nearly 25 to 35% of our overall DPS output. The only thing that makes dropping skills like dots in AoEs worthwhile is the damage that we can get out of them over their entire duration over the course of an entire fight. For example, a skill like Deadly Cloak ticks for about 10k every two seconds. If the skill gets its full duration, this will result in roughly 5k DPS over the course of an entire fight. In a burst situation though, where you may only get to do damage to the boss for 8 to 12 seconds, this skill will get half its value, only doing a total of about 50k damage. Compare this to a spammable like Whirling Blades, which does over 80k damage for one cast, and it's clear that it would have been more worthwhile to cast a spammable here instead of reapplying Deadly Cloak. So when is this concept applicable? As a general rule, a single target burst phase encompasses about a 5 to 10 second window that you have to do damage before you cannot damage the boss anymore. This happens on every single boss fight in the game. For example, if a boss is at 5 mil or less, this means that there are about 5 seconds or less until the boss is dead, indicating a burst phase. If a boss is one mechanic away until it goes into a mechanic where they are invulnerable, this indicates a burst phase. An example might be Zalvaka before she ports, the dragons in Sunspire before they fly into the air, or Lylanar and Turlisso before they do their interrupt mechanic. If the boss has short damage phases that are a part of the fight structure, like Ohms and Asylum Sanctorum, these are burst phases. Finally, bosses with little to no health, like the Spider in Vhoff or the Snake in VRG, are fights short enough to be considered full-on burst fights, which would entail that it wouldn't be worth reapplying any dots or AoEs once cast. As a general rule, if you cannot get at least half the duration of your dot or AoE, it is not worth reapplying. Once you are familiar enough with a fight, you can gauge when that value will be applicable. It will be worth worth reapplying a couple of dots just before you hit a burst window a little early if they are going to expire soon. But if that window is open, you're kind of stuck with what you gave yourself in terms of preparation. For example, assume we are on a fight like Zalvaka. In this fight, she'll usually do three mechanics on the first floor before the first port. If you didn't reapply some dots a little early in preparation by the time mech 3 comes along, you're best off spamming and just taking the L with what damage could have been. However, if you anticipate this and reapply any skills that will fall off during that burst phase, one or two seconds early and then spam only when that phase happens you maximize your damage on fights like vast though that don't require any guesswork regarding the burst phase the rotation will be consistent it will only ever be worth laying your dots and aoe's one time after a protector dies and then using your spammable which on the crow is always blast bones plus whatever actual spammable you are running until the next protector is up fights like the spider and vhoff though work a similar way this fight allows you to drop all of your dots and aoe's and then spam only until the boss is either in invuln or finished. And with that, the biggest mistake I see players make is how they conduct their trash damage. Each and every trash fight in the game is a burst type of fight. The adds usually have anywhere from 2-3 to three million health apiece for high priority targets. Divide that by 8 damage dealers and that's at most about 400,000 damage that you need to do to a target each. Quick math says that your spammable will get you there far faster than any dot or AoE. Again, in this toolkit you have to wait 20 seconds to get 100k damage out of a skill like Deadly Cloak. You can use the skill as a pre-buff, sure, but why use that skill in the middle of a trash pull if your spammables will get you well over 100k damage in 2 seconds? The best rule to follow for trash is to pre-buff with as much as you can, but when the fight starts, do not lay down more than 2 dots or AoEs and then only use your spammable. Preparing for trash is what will maximize your damage, but if you make a mistake in that preparation, don't decrease your damage further with useless casts. Your spammable is worth so much more than anything else in your toolkit for these types of pulls. Stop laying all of your dots in AoEs. Pick two and then spam only. This concept applies even to EC as well. With a skill like Whirling Blades, it will rarely ever be worth laying all three EC dots. The damage loss you suffer individually is more than the group would gain in damage output. The shorter a trash pull, the less worthwhile it is to get all three effects active. Rebuff with Cloak and Blast Bones, cast Boneyard and Wall, cast Blast Bones one more time, and then begin spamming. If everyone in your group does this, especially with an AoE spammable, your trash damage will increase tremendously.
Thank you so much, everybody, for checking out the video. As always, if you found the video helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, and let me know in the comments section below if you have any questions at all. I pride myself on responding to every single comment, and feel free to test me on that statement. Be sure to join the Discord in order to get access to the full written guide. The written guide has over 20 pages of information, most of which is in this video. But the written guide is an easy way to control F your way to any topic that you might not feel super comfortable on after watching. Likewise, I'm on Twitch, Twitter, TikTok, and Patreon. Be sure to shoot me a follow on those platforms as well. I would greatly appreciate it. A special shout out and thanks yet again to the one and only Alduin for providing the insane 128.8k parse that we're getting ready to take a look at. Alduin has been throwing up some insane numbers for almost every class in Update 40. You have to check him out if you haven't already, his link is in the description. Show him some love, it's well deserved. A special shout out and thank you to all my current patrons, Clyde, Reef, Plug, and Joseph. Thank you so much for your support in making this video possible. I couldn't do it without you, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your support. And thanks to all of you as well for all of your love and support. I appreciate each and every one of you, and I will see you in the next one.